My name is Amy Korczynski, and I'm the Archivist and Manager of Corporate Heritage for TD Bank Group, and I'm also on the board of the CBHA. We're here right now to talk about the Auto Pact, or more formally, the Automotive Products Trade Agreement of 1965, and we'll hear from Greg Keenan, Andre Solzenko, and Eugene Beaulieu in that order. We would first like to thank our sponsors again, Deloitte, the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History, the Rotman School of Management, the Department of History, University of Toronto, all for supporting the conference and for making this session possible. Greg Keenan is going to start us off. He is a former reporter at the Globe and Mail who covered the automotive industry between 1995 and 2018. He is a graduate of the University of Toronto and of the University of Western Ontario's School of Journalism. Greg will present the auto pact by the numbers, including the example of Chrysler's Pillet Road large van plant, and will touch on the Japanese lobbying effort that helped to lead to the WTO challenge. He will use data on production, employment, trade balance with US, and capital investment to show how successful the auto pact was from a Canadian perspective. Finally, he will describe how it was used as a policy tool after 1965 to leverage investment out of automakers. Please join me in welcoming Greg. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy. And thank you for including me in this distinguished conference. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to look at the auto pack by the numbers, uh, although I think this quote might be a better way of summing up how successful the deal was for Canada. Uh, now, that, of course, is fake news. Uh, because it was uh, not Donald Trump, but Lyndon Johnson who made this remark to uh, Canada's ambassador to the United States, Charles Ritchie, a couple of years after the agreement was put in place. I want to thank Michael Hart for uh, pointing this out to me. Um, now, this is, uh, this is LBJ uh, in his ranch um, in Texas. Uh, by most accounts, that this vehicle, if you want to call it that, uh, was a crappy car and a lousy boat. Uh, and it was made in Germany and thus not part of the auto pact. But if any was interested, uh, there's one for sale on Kijiji, I think in Hamilton, for about $70,000. Uh, well, yeah, the numbers, the numbers. Um, so there are several indicators we can look at to assess uh, how successful the auto pact was for Canada. And the first one is vehicle production. So the auto pact uh, took effect in 1965. So we're going to look at the 1960 numbers. Uh, in 1960, Canada produced fewer than 500,000 vehicles a year. And by 2000, uh, the last full year the auto pack was still on the books, the industry was producing almost 3 million vehicles per year. And we had five different automakers uh, making cars in Canada. Uh, and in fact, output did top 3 million the year before in 1999, and that was the high water mark for vehicle production in Canada. And there's another key production indicator that's not on this chart, and it's called the production to sales ratio. In the early 1960s, automakers were making roughly one car, one vehicle in Canada for every vehicle they sold here. That ratio grew very sharply after the Auto Pact in 1965. It hit a peak in 1995 when automakers were built more than two vehicles in Canada for every one they sold here. And we still have, in fact, uh, a sales to production ratio that is greater than one to one, although it's gradually coming down to almost one. Another key um, indicator, I think, is employment. So in 1960, you know, less than about 40,000 people employed in auto parts and automotive vehicle manufacturing in Canada. Um, by the 1980s, it had gone to 100,000 people, and it's still, that, it's still more than 100,000 now. It's about 120,000 in vehicles and parts. And then we look at investment. So after 1965, investment by both parts makers and auto companies soared. Uh, in fact, we had several assembly plants that opened uh, after the auto pact in, in the mid to late 1960s. GM's plant in Santa Teresa opened. Uh, it was closed a few decades later. Uh, Ford began making cars in St. Thomas in 1967 as, as direct impact of the auto pact. Uh, that plant closed its doors in 2011. Uh, but there was an incredible flood of investment into Canada uh, after 1965. And then there's the trade balance. This is one of the key points from the Canadian perspective um, before 1965. One of the reasons they went after the, the deal with the U.S. was to reduce the, the trade 
deficit that Canada had in the automotive sector with the U.S. Uh, they wanted to reduce it, eliminate it, or even reverse it, and it was very successful in reversing uh, the deficit. I mean, as you, as you can see, it went up to you know billions of dollars uh, by 2000 uh, in surplus, and we have not had an automotive trade deficit with the United States since 1981. We have an auto deficit with almost every other auto-producing company in a country in the world except the U.S. Beyond the numbers, though. Um, was kind of the impact on, on trade policy and investment. The, the agreement gave the federal government a lever with which to strong arm the auto companies. So if you think back to Woodstock uh, in 1969 and illegal pot, before the days of legal pot, uh, there was a huge increase in these kinds of vehicles. People wanted these kinds of vans. Uh, they painted them up with these wonderful artworks on the side. Uh, they were even called, in some cases, shag wagons. Um, and I'm not sure that's a verb or a uh, noun when it comes to shag. Um, but the agreement required automakers to effectively make one car in Canada for every car they sold here, but also one truck for every truck they sold. So with the, with the increase in sales of these vehicles, um, Chrysler was out of, out of whack on its auto pack commitments. It wasn't making trucks in Canada. And they were selling a lot of these Dodge Ram vans. Some of them look like this on the inside. I think that's an actual fireplace. <laughs> so Chrysler was out of, out of compliance for several years on the one-to-one -one production and sales requirement. So some smart people at the federal government, um, instead of insisting that Chrysler pay the fine, that they would have accumulated over three, four, five years of, of missing their requirements, they suggested Chrysler build a plant. So Chrysler built this large van plant in Windsor on Pillet Road, um, which went, produced vans for about 30 years. So we got, a, we got a pretty good deal out of that, 30 years, and that closed uh, in the mid-2000s. And I think there's another, there's another successful um, part of the auto pack that we, we can attribute to the auto pack, but it's not really that well known publicly. And I think that's the growth of parts companies in Canada. I mean, Magna was started uh, in 1957. It's one of the few handful of Canadian companies that can still be considered a global champion. It was started in 1957 by Frank Stronach in a, in a garage a couple of blocks north of here. Um, and it owes a lot of its early success and later success to the fact that it was that the auto pack was in place and vehicle companies were required to buy a lot of Canadian parts. Another immigrant entrepreneur, uh, Frank Hassenfratz, founded Linamar in Guelph a year after the auto pack in 1966. Again, uh, some of that growth can be attributed to the auto pack. So what happened after that? Well, the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement of 1989 closed off the auto pack to new entrants. So the Japanese were shut out. Um, and that, the Canada-U.S. deal and NAFTA beginning in 1994 gave automakers different options on how they could treat vehicle imports and exports. So they could import them under the auto pack rules, they could import them under the NAFTA rules, they could import them under the FTA rules. So the auto pack was kind of disappearing at that point. But there was a vestige that remained, and that was the form of tariffs on vehicles made by non-Detroit 3 companies that were imported into Canada from offshore. So the tariff applied to Toyota, for example, bringing in cars from Japan, applied to Honda bringing in cars from Japan, it applied to the Germans bringing in cars from Europe, and anybody else who made a car outside North, outside North America that was imported into Canada who was not a member of the Detroit 3. So that tariff uh, really drew the ire of Toyota in the mid-1990s. There was a president of Toyota Canada named Yoshio Nakatani uh, who began a very public and loud lobbying campaign to, to convince the federal government to eliminate the tariff and level the playing field. Uh, he was turned down. Uh, the government decided to keep the tariff in place despite his entreaties. And so Japan, joined by the European Union, appealed to the World Trade Organization. And as you know, the WTO sided with Japan and Europe in 2000 and ruled that the auto pack provided preferential treatment to the United States. So Canada was forced to abrogate it. Now, in sort of unintended consequences, Nakatani was hoping that that would mean the removal of the tariff, the 6.1% tariff, but the government instead decided to levy it on all vehicles imported from outside North America. So the 
GM, Ford, and Chrysler that were bringing in vehicles like Saabs. GM was bringing in Saabs. Ford was bringing in Jaguars. They all became subject to the 6.1% tariff. And the tariff is still in place for some imports, um, although it's been ended uh, for Korea with the South Korea Free Trade Agreement, and it's going to be eliminated through the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and uh, for Europeans through the CETA deal. So, so the topic of this, uh, of this conference is trade-offs, and I think the trade-off here was that uh, you know, we gave up uh, any idea of a homegrown auto industry in 1965, but I think from a jobs and production and investment perspective, we've, we've done pretty well. Thank you.